ahead. Hey. Welcome, everyone. I'm so delighted that you can be with us today. Um, as you see, our topic for today is incontinence, challenges, and solutions for the individual with Alzheimer's disease. And I'm delighted to see that we have several representatives from the Alzheimer's Association and other um, services in the community, because you know the point of this is to educate as many people as possible about various topics that are of concern to our older population, particularly issues that are being dealt with by people with Alzheimer's disease. So our intent with these webinars is to spread the word and try to educate um, the community and also connect people with local services at their chapters and their communities <coughs> and other community um, offerings. So I want to introduce you first to our two expert panelists, um, and then I'm going to turn it over to them to go ahead and get into our content, and then we will come back for some questions and answers. Our first panelist that I want to introduce is uh, Terry Decker, who is the Clinical Director of Home Care Delivered based here in Richmond, Virginia, where she provides support and education for caregivers and patients regarding incontinence, diabetic, urological, ostomy, and wound care supplies. Founded in 1996, Home Care Delivered provides an extensive offering of quality name brand medical supplies delivered directly to one's home. Our second panelist is Deborah Perkins, who is a geriatric clinical nurse specialist, consultant, and president of GeroCare Advocates. Debbie strongly believes in the preservation of dignity for all older adults throughout the health care continuum, and she guides individuals and families as they navigate the health care system and resources. As an advocate, her vision is that all older adults experience optimal health and function safety and care excellence. I'll direct you all to the newsletter where you can see the um, extensive background and education for our panelists. Um, so you can take a look at that later. And I'm Ann Welliford. I am the chair of the Education Corps for Faculty and a member of the Alzheimer's Commission. And I am going to be your moderator for the day. So I'm going to turn this back over to Terry and Debbie to go ahead and begin with our content. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Um, this is Terry, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about this very important topic. We can define incontinence as the loss of control of the bladder or bowel, and that is urinary or fecal incontinence. And incontinence has a variety of causes as well as factors that can be contributing to it. And Alzheimer's disease and dementia can certainly be one of the causes. And so what I'd like to do today is explain, first of all, the very complex mechanism needed to have control of our bladder and bowel. And then we're going to take a look at some of the types of incontinence and some of the factors that can lead to incontinence. And then hopefully talk about the good news that there is help out there. There are some treatment and management options. Uh, certainly that can help. So let's look at some statistics here. Looking at urinary incontinence, we see the prevalence is vastly that of a female issue, 85% women versus 15% men affected with urinary incontinence. And then when we look at those age 60 and older, we see about 38% of women age 60 or older reporting some type of urinary incontinence, 17% of males. Looking at the next chart, this is in millions, okay? These are lives affected by incontinence. 5.5 million people with fecal incontinence, 13 million uh, affected with urinary incontinence. So the number of lives affected is very high. And yet this condition is not well publicized at all. And what we're going to do now is take a look at what's involved in order to have continence of the bladder. So we're going to have a little anatomy lesson for the day. Uh, first of all, urine, of course, is made by our kidneys, and our kidneys work to filter the blood, and then that urine travels down two tubes called ureters and the urine drains then into the bladder. The bladder, think of it as a hollow 
muscular organ, and it expands kind of like a balloon as it fills up with urine. So in order for the bladder to empty, uh, there's a muscle here. The bladder muscle must make a contraction, and that will force the urine out past two sphincters. And these sphincters are very important to helping to control the flow of urine. And as well, this pelvic muscle here, think of it like a sling. Here's the pelvic floor muscle. This acts to hold up our organs, our pelvic organs, in place. So also very important is our brain and spinal cord. So... This is important to keeping all of the, the working going on correctly. So, for example, the brain might receive a signal that, oh, the bladder is full. Okay, so the, the person may consciously uh, contract the muscles of the, the sphincter, the pelvic floor muscles, to hold off until we get to the appropriate place. Once we're at the toilet, then a couple of things have to happen in coordination. The bladder muscle has to contract, a, a good enough contraction to get the urine out, as well as the sphincters have to relax. And so when all of that is coordinated, voila, we can urinate. So problems with bladder control can stem from any number of issues. For example, you can have bladder control problems when the bladder muscle uh, does irregular or abrupt uh, contractions when it's not an appropriate time. So these uh, can this can lead to incontinence, as well as if the bladder muscle isn't contracting well enough at all, th this can lead to some emptying issues. Then there are people that have problems in the sphincter area where the sphincter is not closing adequately, pelvic floor muscle damage, so they may have uh, some loss of urine uh, problems. And as well, the brain and spinal cord, of course, have to be uh, intact. Now, one other point, uh, one point I want to make about the female is uh, we saw that 85% of the people with incontinence is, is women. And so why, you may be wondering, why is this such a huge uh, female issue? <coughs> a lot of it has to do with the, the length of the female urethra. We know the female urethra uh, in here is only a couple centimeters long and travels through the, the pelvic floor muscle and then pretty much you're at the outside of the, uh, of the body, whereas the male urethra, of course, is much longer and extends um, out from the body. Also, for females, after menopause, there's a, there's a sharp decline in estrogen levels, and estrogen is an important hormone that impacts uh, bladder function. There's also the possibility for females that they can have bladder muscle uh, weakness or damage that may be associated with childbirth. So hopefully from this you can see there's a lot that has to work correctly in order for us to have bladder control. And uh, something I think many of us pretty much take for granted, um, that is until something goes wrong. So let's move now to the digestive system. We're going to stay with our anatomy here another minute. Uh, but looking at digestion, we know we eat food and it travels down, uh, enters our stomach and goes through our small intestine. That's where all the nutrition gets absorbed. And then it goes through the large intestine. That's where the fluids and electrolytes get absorbed and ends up in the rectum. Now we're going to look over here at a, at a larger view of the rectum. The rectum serves as our storage for the stool. And an important feature of the rectum is its ability to stretch so that the stool can be held, albeit temporarily, but held until the toilet can be reached. So also uh, we have two uh, sphincters, the anal sphincters, that we can control consciously of the passage of the stool. And once again here, the brain and spinal cord absolutely critical to the control. And the brain controls, of course, pelvic muscles and, and the sphincters here. Another factor for uh, stool incontinence is that the, uh, the consistency of the, of the bowel movement is critical because uh, what, what we want to have is a soft-form stool because there certainly can be problems 
when the person has severe constipation. Um, for example, uh, there's something called a fecal impaction, and that's when a very large, hard mass of stool builds up in the rectum and gets lodged, basically, and then liquid stool can ease or ooze around this, and uh, the person may mistake this for a, for a frequent diarrhea when, in fact, it's a, it's a fecal impaction. As well, on the other extreme, severe, severe diarrhea can render someone incontinent of stool even if they have fairly good sphincters uh, as well as a good brain function, but uh, severe diarrhea can impact uh, bowel continence. Okay, we're going to move back to the urinary system, and what this is showing us is an array of different types of urinary incontinence that exist. And we're going to look more closely at each one of these but uh, knowing what we do about the anatomy of how the bladder works should really help us get through this uh, very quickly to uh, see what is involved in all these different types of incontinence. So let's start with the first one, stress. Now, this is not anything to do with emotional stress, but rather a principle of physics, if you will. So we've had anatomy. Now we've got to move on to physics, okay? So when a force, from something like a cough, a laugh, a sneeze, a strong force pushes on our abdominal muscle. That force then is exerted, uh, exerts a pressure on the bladder muscle. And if the force or the pressures of the sphincters are not able to hold off the force from uh, onto the bladder muscle, then a small leak of urine can occur. And so we see this, and it's a very much a female issue. Uh, so doing things like coughing, laughing, sneezing, lifting uh, can cause little leaks of urine. The next type is urge. And when we talk about urge incontinence, this uh, involves that sudden, very abrupt bladder contraction. And this occurs often with very little or no warning. Uh, it's as if when the person feels the urge to urinate, they better already be on the toilet. <laughs> so it's, it's a very little warning. And in this case, the bladder really leaks a large amount of urine. We're not talking about little squirts of, of urine. We're talking about a larger amount. And this can occur in a variety of uh, places. We, we see this in people with neurologic problems such as MS and stroke, Parkinson's. And to an extent, we'll see this, we can see this in someone with with Alzheimer's disease. Now, a point here, too, is there's also a condition called overactive bladder, which is associated with urge incontinence. It's related. And this uh, is characterized by the urgency to urinate. And you may have seen the commercial, got to go, got to go right now. There are people that have what we call overactive bladder, but they're not incontinent. The person may... Uh, be able to manage effectively over the years. In other words, they have, they have these fairly abrupt uh, contractions of the bladder, but they know how to uh, squeeze the pelvic floor muscles. They, they managed and uh, made some alterations to their, to their lifestyle, and so they, they manage over the years. But as that cognitive status might decline, as with Alzheimer's disease, we see that maybe the person will then you know, begin to develop uh, some of the incontinence. There's also something called mix, and that's just a, a combination of stress and urge incontinence, and that's very much the, the, the most common type of urine loss that we see in women. There's also uh, overflow, and that's a whole different mechanism occurring with overflow. It's not quite as common as the, the others above. But here, the problem is one where the person actually has trouble emptying. And you may say, Terry, well, if they can't empty their bladder, how are they incontinent? Well, what I'd like you to do is picture a glass of water, and it's full to the very top with water, and pretend that's the bladder. Now, take a pitcher of water, and you're going to pour some water into the glass. What happens to the excess water? is filled out. 
such as with the bladder. When the extra urine is added, it just just spills right out. This is uh, it's uncontrolled. The person doesn't know this is happening. So the bladder is full, extra urine is added, and it spills out. Now, this can happen from a couple different reasons. It could be a blockage, and we see this in men who have enlarged prostate glands. And secondly, we see it uh, if that bladder uh, contraction, the muscle, isn't effective. So, again, some of the neurologic uh, diseases, MS, spinal cord injured individuals, and to some extent people with diabetes, when they have neurologic association, may have some emptying difficulties. And in this case, these people benefit by catheterizing themselves. And that gives a good emptying to the bladder, and then they're not doing this overflow, overflow. And uh, some people may catheterize themselves just once a day, and it's just enough to to get that uh, incontinence to improve. Now then, the, the term functional incontinence refers to incontinence that's associated with problems outside the urinary tract. So, for example, as we age, we tend to lose some of that ability to delay urination. We can't hold it off as long as when we're younger. And combine that with the increased time. It may take an older person to get up out of the chair. Uh, arthritic issues in the hands affecting the uh, removal of clothing. And we see people as they get older, occasional episodes of incontinence perhaps. There's also under this category problems in thinking or communicating. And here is really where we see the vast majority of the problems that occur for the person with Alzheimer's disease. It is really complex brain work to receive that signal from the bladder uh, that it's full, to recognize that signal, decide what to do about that signal, and then go ahead and follow through with that action plan, uh, actually get to the bathroom, recognize the bathroom, handle all the clothing involved. And all of this is, is very complex brain work uh, to getting a successful trip to the bathroom. Now, there's also uh, important for us to think about transient causes of incontinence because these can be things that are happening for the person uh, with Alzheimer's, and they're temporary things, and the, the good news is they're more fixable. Okay, so these are some things that easier to fix. The latter infection. This is one of the most common infections in the body and can make a person have an accidental loss of urine. Uh, often people will notice symptoms, frequency, burning with urination. However, in the elderly, the only symptom may be increased confusion. So it's important to be aware of, of, of some, things, some of these. Medications, that's a big one. A lot of people are on uh, many medicines. Of course, they need these, especially diuretics, uh, used for water retention, high blood pressure, heart medicine. But in communicating with the health care provider, maybe we can work at a, a medicine schedule that will help. Uh, constipation, this is a big contributor to urinary incontinence because of putting pressure on the bladder. Also, older women can have trouble with things like urethritis and vaginitis where the tissue is very friable. Um, and these are problems that should be addressed by the GYN doctor because there are things like estrogen creams that can be very beneficial to these women. And people with the overactive bladder I mentioned uh, may find dietary irritants, could be caffeine, carbonated beverages, spicy foods that are in their uh, bladder. Also, for transient bowel types of incontinence, we mentioned the fecal impaction, all foods, beverages that can be irritated, as well as infections, and certainly medicine. Now, a couple of uh, important in uh, interventions here. Foremost, check with the health rule out any of the uh, transient problems, especially the bladder infection, fecal infection. Those, those really need to be addressed. And then there's something called a bowel and bladder diary. It's a guide that you can, uh, as a caregiver, can keep where you uh, put, like, the hours of the day down on the left side of your paper, you know, 6 a.m., 7 a.m., 8 a.m., and then across the top you're going to put things that are taken into the body, like they drank eight ounces of coffee and they ate a bowl of oatmeal at 
7 a.m. So you're going to write down what they ate and drank and what time, and then you're also going to put any uh, trips to the bathroom, successful trips to the bathroom. Okay, they, they voided or they had a bowel movement, as well as you're going to record the consonant episode. So from this, we can get an idea of the person's habits and then schedule some trips to the bathroom uh, to avoid some incontinence episodes. And that's called putting somebody on a toileting schedule. And, and that bowel and bladder diary just kind of helps uh, to decide when are some appropriate times to take the person's restroom. So I think I've done enough talking for now. I'm going to turn over to um, Deborah Perkins for her ideas about the management. Thank you, Terry, so much. And it's such a pleasure to be with you all this afternoon. Terry mentioned that there are just numerous steps involved in the, um, the complex task of successful urinary toileting, and I tried to, to list the ones that I could come up with, and I came up with about 13, and I may well have left some out, but just to, to go over that again, recognizing the urge, taking the bathroom when, they're, when you're aware of the urge, turning the light on in the bathroom, shutting the bathroom door, adjusting our clothing, for men directing the flow, while standing for women sitting down on the toilet and then standing again, successfully using the toilet paper to cleanse oneself and placing the toilet bowl, flushing the toilet, placing clothes in order again, washing the hands, which in itself has numerous steps involved in that task, opening the door, turning off the light, and returning to previous activity. Well, we know with the degenerative process that occurs with dementia, there are many factors that are going to affect urinary incontinence. And this can cause individuals with dementia, their caregivers, and their families significant distress. And we find that the urinary incontinence is often the issue which leads families to seek long-term placement for their loved ones. So successful management of this issue is often dependent on the attention, the patience, and the creativity of the caregiver. And it often involves a trial and error approach. The ultimate goal is the preservation of that individual's and what is so very important is to focus on that individual's remaining abilities rather than what deficits are present. So we're going to look at, and just for just a few minutes, some of the patient factors and what are some of the interventions that can go along with that. The first one you see here is that as um, individuals with dementia often are unaware they have a problem and may ignore the wet, wet clothing, it's very important to always have a set of extra clothing and incontinent products. Cover the mattresses and protective covers, and we know that there are a variety of manufacturers now um, we can purchase wonderful furniture already with those protective coverings. Pre-place the protective pads in the briefs to avoid that step for individuals. And I would encourage that removing the cloth briefs, nylon briefs, or whatever the individual has been using and soiling totally from the room or from the floor and replacing that just with the protective pull-up garments. And that individuals removing the protective garments, maybe putting the snug-fitting briefs over the product to discourage removal, and there's also some, some literature to show that if, you're, if you are um, applying a brief that has to be um, taped at the side, if you apply one that's taped at the front and then one that's taped toward the back with a double covering, that this can um, possibly discourage removal. It's so important not to scold the individual, um, even though it may be frustrating as it may cause shame and the feelings of depression and lead to some irritation, irritation and aggressiveness. And also, we try to encourage, particularly the caregivers in the um, long-term care facilities, to use names that are familiar for individuals, whether it's briefs or it's something to explore with the family what they've normally called their undergarments, but not to use the word diapers and also not brand names such as attends and things of that sort, which may be confusing. To remember that all accidents cannot be prevented, so using durable clothing that can easily be washed and also um, footwear that can be washed as well. Now, I've got to go back because I think I have slide. Let me see. Let me see. Just one second. I'll help you. Here. Thank you. Next one. Next one? Uh-huh. Thank okay. you. Okay. Sure. Just one second. Um, as individuals may also be unable to communicate the need to urinate, um, in recognizing the appropriate time to urinate, it's so important to attend to the individual as soon as possible when the need has been identified. Always know where the bathrooms are located, no matter where you are in what setting or if you're out and about. Monitor closely for those signs and that the individual may need to urinate and make 
nervousness, rubbing of their arms or legs, touching the genital area, pressing knees or legs together as if they're trying to hold um, the need to urinate, or pulling at their clothes, and even shifting their weight from one leg to another. Terry mentioned a urinary diary as a way to sort of come up with an idea of what the normal urinary pattern is for a loved one. Some use habit training. They use that diary to try to identify when their loved one has a, a pattern of, of toileting and use that pattern to assist them to the bathroom on a regular schedule. Others will use more of a scheduled toileting approach where they'll help the individual toilet immediately upon arising in the morning, before and after meals, and then at bedtime and scheduling in between those times, for example, every two hours. You start with a longer period of time. You might try every three hours in between. If that doesn't work, you move to an every two and adjust accordingly as to how long individuals are able to remain continent. We discourage the question, do you need to go to the bathroom? <clears throat> you don't want to give individuals the opportunity to say no, but it's better to say it's time to go to the bathroom because often they'll say yes when they mean no and no when they mean yes, etc. Um, do not restrict the fluids. That has often been a practice of, of um, the past, but because dehydration is such a significant issue with many of our um, residents and individuals, we say do not restrict the fluids. You might limit them just before bedtime. But as Terry had mentioned, eliminating some of the bladder irritants, such as caffeine or carbonated be beverages, which might you know, um, be a problem with the twitchy bladder, might be important. And then attention to the individual's voiding schedule, particularly if they're taking medications such as diuretics and other medications that might affect the urinary system in order that you can plan or maybe toilet more frequently during those times. Can you do the next slide, Nico, please? Yep. Thanks. Just one second. And I'll try, to, I'll try to get it right from that point on. No, don't worry. Uh, to go back, what you didn't see on the last, um, I didn't stay on the last slide, is always praise the individual for success. I don't say go overboard, but be very, um, you know, um, just give them a, a great um, feeling when they are successful. Affected individuals may also have difficulty locating the bathroom or may toilet at inappropriate locations that they perceive to be the bathroom or the toilet. Very often you don't know what this is until the event happens. But, for example, sinks, flower pots, trash cans, corners, drawers, and radiators seem to be some of the more common areas that might be um, mistaken for a toilet or a bathroom area. So covering those in some way is helpful. Ensuring that the bathroom pathway is uncluttered, well lit, and well marked so there's not anything that necessarily distracts them or stops them on the way. Using signs and drawings in the hallways and on the doors may be helpful. Some have felt that using men's room, men's restroom, or women's room, women's restroom, might be pre um, prefer um, preferable to using the word toilet or using the picture of a toilet, but I've seen all used successfully. And then keeping the light on in the bathroom as a guide pretty consistently. Some people have used the sensors, the light sensors, so that when somebody enters the room, it goes on, but that does not necessarily act as a guide for somebody who is on their way to the restroom. Thank you, Michelle. Also, individuals with dementia may be unable to remember why they're in the bathroom, once they reach it, and they may not even remember, as, as um, Terry mentioned, what a toilet is or how to use it. So in trying to um, encourage them with this, always use adult words familiar to the person. It's discouraged to use things such as the potty, or anything that might be misconstrued as baby talk. Um, accompany the loved one to the bathroom as necessary. And this has been particularly problematic for some of the individuals in our support group who went out and about and traveling with their um, loved ones, encounter a men's room and are not able to enter that. But we are finding that you're seeing more family bathrooms in the malls and at some of the rest stops and things of that sort, which is making it easier for individuals to accompany their loved ones. Guide the individual verbally by demonstration or actually with hands-on assistance. Stay as calm as possible and reassure the individual, particularly if they become upset. And then check between the end behind the individual who often will forget to flush. And it may be necessary to cleanse that messy toileting. Let me go back one slide. You can tell this is not my expertise as far as advancing slides. I'll let Nika, I'm going to let you do it from okay. this point on. But affected individuals may also have difficulty um, with 
distraction. And they may find they are unable, they have difficulty with focusing on, on the task once they reach the bathroom. So try to minimize um, distractions, make the bathroom as free of clutter, warm and home light. Provide adequate time to empty the bladder and do not rush the individual. I've mentioned here that at times the mirrors in the bathroom can be very distracting. They may feel that someone is watching him or her because they do not recognize their own um, face in the mirror, so covering the mirror might be helpful. And also if the individual wants to get off the toilet, toilet prior to completion, offering them a glass of water, providing something for them to do or hold could be beneficial as well. Next slide, please. <coughs> One thing I will caution that has been problem for some individuals, if you're trying to allow for privacy and minimize distractions, make sure that the door cannot be locked only from the indoor inside because even the toilet stalls, it can be problematic for the loved one if those are locked or if the toilet doors are locked and they're not able to access the individual. Some individuals will have difficulty even distinguishing the toilet within the bathroom. It is thought that maybe you contrasting colors as far as changing the toilet seat color or some of the surroundings of the toilet can enhance this visibility. It can be problematic, though, because if individuals distinguish a change, they may become suspicious and be resistant to using the toilet. So again, that's trial and error. And then if you can sort of put yourself in the position of the individual who's having difficulty interpreting their environment, the toilet to them represents a hole with water that you can fall into and can represent something very dangerous. So that might um, be a reason that there's some resistance with using that. Next slide, please. Difficulty initiating the task goes along with dementia, and so maybe running the sink water, flushing the toilet might stimulate urination, helping with the first or second step to help individualize the task, and just using one-step instructions as we know that it's very difficult for individuals to follow a two-step or three-step instruction. Next slide, please. Terry mentioned that flexibility and mobility are particularly um, challenging for individuals as they age and also with individuals with dementia. And it may be impaired because of changes with um, gait or restricted by jerry chairs, side rails, or restraints in some of our facilities. So removing any physical barriers which might hinder access to the bathroom, um, having somebody stay on the level where the bathroom is so they don't have to use the steps, providing toilet seats, padded seat handrails for support and safety, letting occupational therapy really look at that task to see what they can do to make it as functionally um, appropriate as possible. Placing a portable bedside commode in the area where the individual spends most of the day and using a privacy screen might be a good solution for some families. And then particular, particularly with travel, using other equipment such as male or female handheld urinals, bedpans, or external catheters, particularly for men can be important as well. And then effective individual, oops, I did it again. Would you advance two slides for me? Hold on just one second. Uh, the next one you want, yes. right? Uh-huh, please. And the next one. And the next one. Uh-huh. And the next one. I don't know how I went back four slides. <laughs> I apologize for that. No, no, it's okay. And then, of course, the apraxia or difficulty carrying out motor functions is such a significant issue with dementia, particularly in advanced dementia. It affects manual dexterity, <coughs> manipulation of clothing and hygiene. So anything we can do to replace snaps, buttons, and zippers with Velcro, Velcro strips or using clothing with elastic waistbands to make it more easily removable. Monitor very closely for urinary tract infections secondary to poor toilet and hygiene. And I'd like to add... That when individuals are accompanied to the physician's office or even within our facilities, individuals with dementia really do need someone to assist them with collection of clean catch urine specimens. I learned that the hard way when one of my first patients that I sent to the bathroom came out with the urine collected in the top of the container only. And of course, it was causing quite a problem as far as spillage. So very often they need someone to accompany them into the bathroom to actually do the cleansing for the specimen to allow them to initiate the urine, hold the container after they started to collect the midstream so that the specimens are not contaminated. And we tried to do that in, prep in, in trying to prevent any need for a single cast in order to get a clean specimen. And then also show the individual where the toilet paper is located. If excessive amounts are being used, maybe replace and just put small amounts on the roll where easily accessible or many have good results with using pre-moistened hygiene wraps. 
swipe. I'd like to just give you an example, a clinical example, of an individual who, despite everything they're doing to try to maintain their own continence, the barriers that they're exposed to. I have an individual that I'm following currently in in an assisted living facility. She lives on the second floor, a fairly good distance from the elevator. And so when she comes to the first floor where there's dining and activities, she remains on that level for a good part of the day. There is a bathroom that's located on that level, but there's only one, and it serves the needs of all the residents. And usually there's a fairly good number that are down there. So once she feels the urge to urinate, she needs to go to that bathroom, and currently she still is able to successfully find that door, but often has an extended wait as other residents are using the restroom, and they have a longer period of time than it usually takes them to toilet. Um, Because that she still has her nylon nylon briefs very accessible in the room, she refuses to use any type of protection. And unfortunately, she has always worn wool clothing. And so she continues to do that, and her um, care um, partner does purchase those wool pants, and so when those become wet and soiled, they are very, very uncomfortable, very itchy, and it requires dry cleaning on a very, very, very frequent basis. And unfortunately, she becomes extremely anxious and agitated because of the difficulty that she's encountering and the barriers she's encountering in trying to maintain her continence. So that's just an example of some of the challenges that she, one resident, is, is experiencing. Okay, Mika, we can turn it over to some questions. Thank you both. That's I'm sorry, we go back to Terry. Yeah. Oh, I think we're going to go back to Terry in a minute, but I want to open it up to see if others have questions before I jump into some of my questions that I have. Anyone? I came in late, Ann. This is Judy. Hi, Judy. How are you? Welcome. Um, no, that was great. I don't have any so far. Um, that was wonderful. Wasn't that wonderful? Well, I'm so wonderful so, explanation. I'm so delighted with this combination of, I love the anatomy and the physics lesson. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm so impressed. And then also the focus on the interventions. I would like to um, go back to Terry for a minute and ask a question about, you know, you mentioned the, all the commercials that we're seeing about got to go, got to go. And I'm wondering, do you think that there's been an increase um incidence and prevalence of incontinence, or is it just due to the increased number of people? Why we're having more incontinence? You know, it could actually be more people are now talking about it. Mm -hmm. I've seen a study where, or or a, a, a piece I've heard, that a woman will wait seven years before speaking to her physician about urinary incontinence. Wow. So it could be the the taboo. Mm-hmm. Um, I I don't know about any. You know, is it our diet? Is it our this, that, or the other thing? Why we we have this uh, incontinence? I will say that I think that the commercials about uh, gotta go, gotta go right now is bringing actually some some good dialogue, and and people are are reaching out for help and realize, oh, I don't need to suffer uh, in silence. <laughs> you know, get help. So so maybe we're we're doing a better job of, of letting people know that. I, I don't know. Well, I certainly hope so, and I think that that's one of the benefits of um, us spending some time on these various topics because, you know, we can start to spread the word and make sure people have a, a better understanding that there are things to do. And that's so common in age-related issues in general. For, all, for a long time, people have thought, well, it's just normal aging. And, you know, as Debbie's pointed out, there's a lot of interventions that we can use, so... Um, clearly there are things that we can do to make things better for folks. Exactly, and I think uh, especially in the female population, you know, well, you know, my mom had incontinence, my, my grandma, I know, I remember as a kid, you know, my grandma, no, I'm not saying that for me, but I'm just saying women just tend to think, well, it's, it's normal. It's a normal part of aging, but any incontinence is an abnormality, whether you're 100 years old or, you know, whatever age. So, so it's really important to talk to the healthcare professional because, there, like we said, there there are options. It may not cure it, but it could help. Right. Certainly. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you for that. I think that was all quite eye-opening. And, Debbie, I'm delighted at the focus that you had on 
using the adult language and saying, you know, briefs or whatever the um, whatever the loved one is comfortable with in terms of language and not calling them diapers because, again, that's an issue of maintaining people's dignity and um, avoiding that elder speak that's so common um, that I think we think we're being kind, but it can be very um, dehumanizing. Terry, are, are you going to mention at all the medications that are used for treating the, the um, overactive bladder? Uh, well, just briefly, the, the Ditropan, Daytrol, uh, these types of drugs. Uh, I just, are, are you going to, are, are, do you have a slide on that? Uh, no, I wasn't. I just uh, wanted to, to mention in regards to that as well, to consult your pharmacist because of those products, which of those medications, which can be very helpful and effective for patients, there are some that are better for individuals with Alzheimer's than others mm-hmm. because some have a more uh, um, a greater effect on confusion than others. So be sure mm-hmm. to consult the pharmacist on that. Mm-hmm. They even have, if, if taking the pills is an issue, there's even the patches. There's the type with the patches. And um, and common side effects, though, on those uh, dry mouths. But, but it's, you can try different ones, like like you mentioned, Debbie, and see you know which is going to provide the least dry mouth and the the least issues for uh, the the uh, confusion. I can't recall which one on the top of my head, but one has less anticholinergic properties and less confusing properties. So that's why it's important to to check mm-hmm. that as well. Thanks. Mary. Right, and know that there are different ones. So if one's right. not really working the, uh, correctly. Um, I was going to talk about some of the absorbent products. Is yes, that okay? let's go ahead and move into that now. Is that okay? Okay. Um, well, certainly when absorbent uh, products become necessary, it's good to know that there are a wide array of options. And the chart that you're seeing here is one that it's set up with your lower volume products, such as the bladder control pads here at the top, then uh, more if you have more volume that you're dealing with, the protective underwear or pull-on style, and if the volume is large, then you want to move more towards the brief. Now, one thing about, we'll go back up here to the bladder control pads. This would be an excellent choice for the person with the occasional leaks of urine, somebody that still has enough alertness, uh, maybe uh, able to get to the bathroom. But what we find sometimes is women will, especially women, they're going to reach for feminine hygiene pads because that's what they've used for years, the menstrual pads. And one thing to keep in mind is menstrual pads are designed for blood, and blood is actually a solid. So the bladder control pads have what's called polymers in them, and they're designed for urine, which is a liquid. So that is one important point. And on the bladder control pads, you can get everything from a, from a very small little liner type product to a very large pad, and there's actually some that are, that are really, really large um, that will accommodate clo- close to a full void. Now, for the gentlemen, uh, there's plenty of men that really don't like the thought of anything that resembles a pad, something that resembles what their wife uses. They're just very averse to that. So there are male, what they call male guards, but they're little pads that go in a man's underwear, and they go into the front of their underwear, and this is good for a man who has struggle with little dribbles of urine. And so these are great uh, products. Also, the belted undergarments, uh, they're, they're kind of like a giant pad with, a, with an elastic-y, uh, stretchy belt-type thing to hold it in place. Now, the, uh, moving on down to when you need a little more of a volume, um, this, the protective underwear, this is really a, a good option. It, it resembles regular underwear, and so for someone with Alzheimer's, it's, they're used to pulling underwear up and down, so this works very well. They're also available in disposable as well as reusable styles. So the reusable style uh, is, is soft and, you know, just very much resembles what they're used to. Now, the protective underwear is a good option for somebody who can make an attempt to get to the bathroom, for example. They're up and around, but if someone's confined to bed, this isn't going to be um, perhaps the best option, as well as it may not meet their nighttime needs. People can have daytime needs and different nighttime needs. So for daytime needs, this may be your ideal product. For nighttime or heavy wetting or certain 
people can find a bed or if a fecal in, involved involvement, they really might be best served in, in the full brief, the tape tab style product. That's going to give you the most absorbency. And, um, and also within each of these categories are going to be levels of absorption. So if you need a highly absorbent protective underwear, you can uh, you know, reach for something like that. Uh, and, and that, of course, is going to affect the cost. I uh, mo- wanted to move r- real briefly to skin care because it's really helpful to um, know what's involved in good skin care. So for people, uh, when they have an incontinent episode, the skin really should be cleansed uh, as soon after as possible because that moisture, the ammonia from the urine, and the enzymes from the stool can really play havoc on the skin and lead to rashes and other problems. Um, and mild pH balanced skin cleansers, now, we had anatomy, and we had <laughs> physics, and now we have to have just a, just a drop of chemistry, okay? pH is a measure of hydrogen ions, okay? Our skin likes the pH at about 4.5 to 6.0. So we are acidic beings. And when we use bar soap, typically the bar soaps on the market have a very high pH, upwards of like 8, 9, and 10. So if you're washing skin, especially in the perineal area, frequently throughout the day using, uh, you know, a bar soap, you can really dry out the skin. So the incontinent cleansers on the market today are pH balanced for the most part and really can help the skin uh, stay very healthy. There's also the very uh, nice, convenient adult wipes for easy cleanup, and there's products that are uh, foams and sprays and all this type of thing. Also, there are barrier <coughs> creams and ointments <coughs> to use. <clears throat> and that's really good to protect the skin. As well as just being aware that when you use a, a high-quality absorbent incontinent product, a disposable product, the, the technology in them is, is really improved over the years, and they do a great job of wicking that wetness away. So, for example, if you have somebody that's having multiple voids, but you're not able to uh, help with changing them as frequently as you would like to, Putting them in a very good quality absorbent product can really be very cost efficient in terms of skin health because some of these very high absorbent products can handle uh, multiple voids if if that is the situation and yet keep that wetness uh, away from the skin. So kind of to wrap up here, uh, I hope this has been helpful and that people have gained some insight into uh, first, the various factors associated with urinary and fecal incontinence, um, certainly management options, things that can help, and as we mentioned, contacting the health care provider because incontinence is, is, is an abnormality uh, no matter what age we are. And certainly if you're interested in more reading on urinary incontinence or fecal incontinence, there's the, the website here, the Alzheimer's Association in your area, uh, as a wealth of uh, materials and and, and assistance, and um, the company that I'm with, for example, Home Care Delivered, we have, uh, you know, great quality uh, medical supplies. But one thing I did want to mention, what we have that might help, and that is a sampling program. And for, for instance, on our absorbent products, uh, we have people that can kind of guide and direct and send a sample to the home to see, because this is a nice way to get the best product to meet certain needs. And I just really feel that goes a long way to promoting the comfort and the dignity as best we can uh, for the person. So that's all I have. Thank you. Well, this has been quite eye-opening. You know, again, with the tie-in for the background on the biology, the anatomy, the physics, and even the chemistry. (laughs) 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 Bring in the interventions. And then, you know, with the final piece about um, the the actual skin care and products. I think that's a really, I'm, I'm impressed every time we do one of these, how they tie together. You know, earlier Debbie mentioned some things about mobility, and that connected back to one that we did on falls and um, ambulation and gait. And then, of course, um, skin breakdown was our last session. And then our next session is going to be about medication-related issues. And I'm going to certainly make sure that Patty Slatum brings in a piece about incontinence medications, too. I made some notes about the things that you all said so I can be sure to pass that on to her. Are there questions from our participants? Do you 
Judy, since you're here, do you have anything you'd like to add in terms of how that relates to the session that we had um, last month or anything that you related to with your caregivers? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think that was just a real nice tie-in. Um, if people are interested in looking back at the skincare webinar and, you know, seeing a little bit of, you know, how the moisture, you know, and maceration, you know, affects, you know, the skin breakdown and then something about products, you know, they can look back at that one and, and look into a little bit of that. Um, but, uh, no, I think it's it was a great... Uh, thing to follow up with and I learned a lot. So it's amazing to me how nicely they're fitting together and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm I've been really pleased. Well Terry and Debbie, do you have any closing remarks that you'd like to make or share with our folks? I, I just I I'm I am this is Debbie and I'm constantly amazed just every time you look at the whole topic of urinary urinary incontinence and particularly in regards to dementia, how complex it is and how it takes so many different players in order for that individual to um, maintain success with continence. And I think it's a challenge on a, a lot of different levels. And so I just would encourage as much education that can be imparted to all providers of care. And I think that the persons who are actually doing the toileting within our settings and, and our caregivers at home, the more information that they can be empowered with, it will make all the difference in their ability to provide successful intervention. Yeah. I did, you know, late, late here, but... I may have missed this part, but the basically um, question, I don't know if it's really a question, but I've observed that there are people who are probably not truly incontinent, but when they go to hospital, you know, they call for somebody to help them uh, up to the bathroom, and th the staff just can't manage the number of calls they get and so on and so forth. So they're basically dependent on somebody to take them to the bathroom because they're not entirely mobile. And so then that's where some incontinence begins. And I've heard over and over, well, my mother wasn't in diapers until, you know. And so I don't really know that there's a question here, but I think for us as professionals we need to distinguish between somebody who was probably not incontinent just on history and might be able to regain continence um, after a hospitalization or even a nursing home stay. It's, it's a very uh, hard balancing act to try to convince a lot of our um, care providers in the hospital setting that by prevention of incontinence, that it really will really lessen their labor and their work as far as what can eventually occur in regards to um, the skin breakdown and things of that sort. And so right. it's hard to encourage them to find what that baseline is. Right. And then go with that baseline. And they're right. very concerned about safety, of course, and falls. Right. So that's how that happens. But then folks do come home, you know, incontinent because oh, they've know. they've been voiding in a diaper for now, you know, whatever, exactly. you know, Medicare days they've had in hospital and nursing homes. So I, I, you may have talked about how to go back to continence from there. Well, I think maybe using the, the like the bowel and bladder diary, you know, can kind of right. help. And, and also, you know, to your point, is uh, people are so much sicker nowadays in the hospital. And so, you know, you combine a, a very weakened state and, you know, they're not eating and drinking adequately or they're being, you know, hydrated with the IVs and also. So, yeah, hospitalization, is, you know, puts you 10 steps backwards. But, but, you know, coming home and then, you know, working with the person, don't, you know, give up. You know, it's hard work and it's, <laughs> it's not glamorous, but, you know, helping them to, you know, get the schedule back and, and this type of thing. Right. And, um, the other, um, I guess, well, my closing is just absolutely working with people to avoid constipation. I'm on the constipation bandwagon, but, um, you know, that really impacts urinary incontinence as well as fecal and, the, the you know adequate fluids and uh, working for the bowel health is um, is just something that I just wanted to make sure that put my final word. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, you're um, you're on the constipation or anti-constipation bandwagon, and I'm forever on the maintaining dignity and avoiding elder speak. Bandwagon. They go hand in hand, don't they? Good. We all that together. Good. I want to thank you all again for attending and participating, and please join us for our next session, which, like I mentioned, is going to be on medication-related issues. And um, thanks so much for our expert panelists. This has been quite, quite informative, and 
um, be sure to spread the word because these will be archived on the website and ab available for you to share. Nico, do you have anything else you'd like to add? Uh, just that we are going to post today's um, uh, webinar, so you can you can uh, you know um, just uh, rewind it and look at it and listen to it one more time and have other people um, watch it. And at the same time, the next webinar will be scheduled for December 5. So same time, noon Eastern. Um, so uh, we will be sending everyone a reminder in that sense in a few days. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving.